Cool, I think we're live. Morning everyone, hope everyone is well. So this is part three of biology three, infection and response. We've looked at different types of pathogens so far. So we've been through, I think part one, we looked at uh, bacteria, we looked at viruses, and we looked at some of the diseases that can be caused with those. We also looked at protists and we looked at some of the different structures of some of the different microorganisms quite briefly. So if you're not sure, go back and have a look at some of those videos a bit later on. Then last lessons, this would have been Wednesday, we started going through and we started looking at uh, the body's defences. So we spoke about actually we are surrounded by microorganisms all of the time. Uh, we said that this word pathogen means any microorganism that causes disease and not all microorganisms will cause disease. So for instance, you have more microorganisms on and in your body than you do body cells, but we remain healthy for most of the time. So we started looking at actually, how is it that our body will maintain, uh, sorry, how does the body stop getting infected and what happens when it does get infected? So we spoke about the fact that we've got the skin as this giant barrier around the outside. Um, and even if that gets cut, it will produce scabs and it will reseal itself. We said we've got this fluid around the eyes, which is slightly antiseptic. We said we've got the stomach acid. Uh, we produce mucus and we've got hairs to move things out of the way. And we said that our body does all of this to try and stop itself getting infected. We then went and had a look through and we started looking at what the immune system is. Um, and if you remember, I put down a web link and I said, go and have a look at that web link because it's brilliant. They do a fantastic job of explaining the immune system. Um, but I went through and we looked at this idea of antigens, antibodies um, that are produced by the body. So we said that antigens are on the surface of most pathogens. And what our body has to do is learn to recognise them and to produce the correct antibodies. We looked at white blood cells and we said that actually with the white blood cells, um, there's two main types that you need to be aware of at GCSE. There's more that you, later on if you go on to do biology at A-level. Um, but we said that actually we've got the lymphocytes, which produce antibodies and antitoxins, uh, which will tag the white blood, uh, the antigens on the pathogens and allow them to be destroyed, and the antitoxins, which will get rid of the toxins that bacteria produce. We said we've also got these other white blood cells called phagocytes, and what they do is they will envelop anything they think is wrong with us, and they will destroy it by a process called lysis, where enzymes break down all the things inside those cells. So we need to know what those words mean, because I'm going to start using them in some context as we go through today, uh, particularly when we get to sort of towards the end of the lesson and we're looking at monoclonal antibodies. So it's worth being aware of that as well. Uh, if you're not sure, obviously after this, go back and have a look at those videos. And if you have any questions, I will jump onto a Google Meet afterwards and you can ask me some questions then, um, or just say hello if you want to. So that's hopefully that'll be all right. Right, what I want to start off today then is looking at drug development. So there are several stages to this, and the exam board will expect you to be able to talk about what the stages are. So I'm just going to put this down here. They're going to expect you to talk about what the stages are and why each stage is important. So why is it that we actually have to jump through lots and lots of hoops, lots and lots of different things in order to be able to develop a new drug and bring it to market so it can be used? So that's what I really want to start with. And I'll probably end up going on a few tangents talking about placebo effects, which is still relevant and you still need to know. Uh, for the exams. So let's just start off then with a couple of main examples of drugs because I've seen this come up in exams before and students get it wrong even though they know what the correct drugs are. So I'm just going to put down two types and there's lots more than this. I'm going to put down antibiotics and I'm going to put down painkillers. So by painkillers, I'm talking about things like paracetamol, like ibuprofen. When we're talking about antibiotics, we're talking about things like penicillin. Uh, there's lots of other ones out there as well, but that's probably the most well-known. Now, if you remember, when we started looking at uh, gonorrhea, gonorrhea is a disease that's caused by bacteria. It's a sexually transmitted disease. The exam board bring it up, I think, just because they like grossing students out in the exams. Um, but also, we, need to do, we do need to be aware of what it is and the fact that it's easily preventable by using a barrier such as a condom. The problem is, if we do get infected with gonorrhea, 
The symptoms for it is going to be pain when urinating and we end up with this thick green discharge from the genitals. So there are two, we will actually end up taking a combination of drugs. The painkillers will help obviously just with the pain. But if you're taking paracetamol for something like this, it's not actually going to cure the disease itself. It's not going to get rid of the bacteria. It's only going to treat the symptoms. So what we then do is we end up taking the antibiotics at the same time because the antibiotics will kill off the bacteria. So we end up taking a combination and you need to be aware that actually with a lot of painkillers, they're only treating symptoms. They're not actually treating the root cause of it. So sometimes we need to be aware of the root cause as well so that we can actually make sure we can take the right medication or the right treatment plan. It doesn't necessarily need to be drugs. Um, if we pull muscles, for instance, we know that initially uh, we have to rest it, generally put a cold compression on it, so ice compression, and we can elevate, and then actually start using it again as well. So there is different treatment plans depending on what it is. But in most cases, the painkillers will only treat the symptoms. There are some, exam some sort of additions to that. Uh, ibuprofen and some of the other anti-inflammatories can help with the root cause depending on what it is but a lot of the time people only take them for the pain killing effect not for the anti-inflammatory so it's worth being aware of those different combinations because i have seen it come up in exams where they start talking about how if we were treating a bacterial infection why is it that people take a paracetamol but it doesn't actually treat it and that's just to relieve some of the symptoms now you do need to be aware as well that when we're looking at viruses, antibiotics themselves, they have no effect on viruses. Uh, I know I did speak about this in one of the previous videos, but it's worth putting down again just to make sure it's really clear in your head. So I'm just going to put this down here. The reason it has no effect on viruses is that viruses are really small, much, much smaller than bacteria, much, much smaller than any of our other cells. Um, to the point they're so small that the bacteria themselves, once they infect inside a cell, they reproduce inside the cell and then they cause that cell to burst, uh, which makes us feel quite rough. So we need to be aware of that, that actually they're too small. And because they live inside the cell, most of the treatments for viruses end up actually damaging our body tissue and body cells at the same time, which means we feel really bad. In some cases, we just physically can't kill it without destroying too many of the cells. And at the moment, when we're looking at the HIV virus, uh, we, although treatments are becoming more effective and we are looking at ways of curing it, and I think it is definitely on the cards, that treatment, at the moment, we haven't been able to do that because it's living inside cells. It's very, very difficult to kill it without destroying too much of the body tissue. So antibiotics have no effect on viruses, but they are very effective against bacteria. But saying that, we do need to choose... Oh, that's it. There we go. Choose the correct antibiotic. I'll just put four bacteria here. Okay. Um, so we do need to make sure we choose the correct one for the type of bacteria because different antibiotics work in different ways. So some bacteria will need one particular type, others will need a different one. And if we get the wrong antibiotic, it will have no effect which means, or a very little effect, which means the bacteria carry a multiplying, we get worse, and it can then lead to mutations and other things going wrong as well. So what we will often find is if you go in a hospital with an infection, they will try and take swabs of the infection, and they'll actually grow it. Now, we will come on and we'll have a look at the conditions needed for doing cultures in probably next, it'll be Monday or, Tuesday, or Monday or Wednesday now. Uh, but we'll go through and have a look at doing that, but they'll actually grow the culture so they can look at it under a microscope and they can identify what the bacteria is so that they can actually then select the correct antibiotic for the job. Right, so in terms of drug development then, what we don't want to do is find a new drug, jump straight away, put it out to the market and find out it has some huge side effects. There's been other drugs like that in the past. Uh, thalidomide was actually a drug that was... It was being developed and they realised it was really, really effective against morning sickness in pregnancy. The problem is because some steps were missed, um, because the testing on it wasn't varied enough, what well, they didn't realise it would actually damage the unborn baby. So there were babies that were being born with defective limbs, uh, arms, legs, etc. 
So they've, that was taken off the market straight away. Nowadays, they've realized actually it's also very good at treating, I think it's leprosy. So it's being used again then because they know that actually those people would not be pregnant um, or could not be pregnant with the drug uh, that would be needed. So it started being used again. But that was an example of something that went quite wrong. If you go back through history and you look at a lot of the medication, a lot of the medication initially were from plants. So, and I'll put this down here. Those of you that are watching on Wednesday, my pen is working again. I've got it well away from my coffee, so hopefully I'm not going to drop it in the coffee again because that was quite embarrassing and really didn't help because I couldn't write anything afterwards until it dried out. So a lot of the initial drugs were made from plants. Uh, a couple of examples here. We've got Digitalis, which is now used in the treatment for heart conditions. It can affect the heart rhythm. Um, and it actually comes from the foxgloves. So those of you that have seen foxgloves, they're really common. If you go out walking outside, you go out walking in the woods. In fact, let me just grab a picture here and I'll show you what a foxglove looks like because I think it's quite important just that you can recognise them. We'll just drop this in here. So these are foxgloves. So just a quick Google search. And you'll often see them if you're walking in the woods, if you're walking outside, lots of people has them in their gardens um, and sort of plant them. Uh, they are toxic. So digitalis has been used as a poison in the past because it has an effect on the heart. If you get the dosage wrong, um, it can actually cause the heart to stop. So it, and it works as a poison. However, in lower doses, it can slow the heart down. It can regulate the heart and it can stop what they call, it can reduce the effects of what we call tachycardia, which is racing heart. So it can help regulate it. So we actually use fox gloves now as a normal drug. However, we don't extract it from the foxglove plants because the dosage is too difficult to vary when we get it from a plant. Uh, it's actually much better to synthesize in a lab where we can get exact quantities in the pills so we know how much we're giving to people so there's less chance of getting it wrong. But digitalis has been used for years as a natural drug and as a poison. Uh, the other one that we're going to have a look at Get rid of that from it. The other one that we're going to get, we're going to have a look at, is this one: salicylic acid. And I'll tell you the common name for that in a minute. But the salicylate tree is actually from the willow. And if you go back through history before we started making this particular drug um, artificially, we would have taken the bark off willow trees, and they would have ground it down. They would have steeped it in water to reduce the, sil and the salicylic or the salicylate out into the water and they'd use it for the treatment of headaches. Nowadays it's one of the most common drugs for painkillers and also for thinning blood so for people that struggle and we call it aspirin. But we wouldn't again get it from the bark of trees. One it's not pure enough so there'll be other chemicals as well which can have other side effects. We don't know what the dosage is in the bark so it can vary uh, and there's lots of things that we just cannot control so it's much simpler to make it artificially in a lab. But that's another example of a drug that was originally came from plants that we've gone through, we've purified, we've streamlined the process, and now we actually go through and we make it artificially, and it's one of the most common drugs. I know that people with heart conditions, and they actually recommend a lot of people um, when they get to a certain age, would benefit from taking even a quarter of a tablet um, as a slight blood thinner uh, to try and reduce the effects of heart attacks and that. Now, I'm not saying I recommend doing that, but it is a drug that is very frequently prescribed to people uh, because it has very few side effects. I know a lot of people take aspirin when they're flying, for instance, to reduce the chance of clots. So again, very, very common, very easy to get hold of any country in the world. So we let's just think for a minute. Let me just go on to here and move that up to there. We want to develop a new drug and we've maybe got an idea. It may have originated from plants because actually we are still finding chemicals in either new plants or existing plants. And we're suddenly finding that some of these will have a use that we didn't realise before. In some cases, we're going to some parts of the world that we haven't really explored before and we're still finding new species of animals and plants. 
And what we're finding is some of those chemicals will actually prove very effective treatments, which is why it's so important to try and actually preserve the world as we know it at the moment. If we do start getting rid of lots of rainforests, we start getting rid of lots of parts of the world we, um, we need to protect, then we actually may end up losing treatments that we don't know exists at the moment. Um, other ones, what we have is because through lab testing and through computer modeling, what we we have done is we know that some particular conditions are caused by particular molecules. So if we develop a drug to work on those molecules, and that's one of the things that chemists do, then it may have an effect in the future. But what we need to do is work out whether it is going to have an effect or not. So the first thing we do is what we call preclinical trials. And generally, this is any part of the test which does not involve humans. So to start with, we will be looking at computer modelling. Computers are quite good at predicting how different chemicals and different molecules are going to interact. So we might have an enzyme, for instance, with an active site, and we want to act on that active site. So we could use a computer to model or predict what sort of molecules we would need to make to act there. So we'd look at computer modeling um, and what we could do is we can run it through and it would look on all sorts of known uh, molecules that we have in our bodies, uh, whether it's cell types, whether it's tissue types, and it would predict whether it's going to have an effect. After that, what we're going to do is we're going to be growing cells and tissue samples. So we're going to be basically growing these in a Petri dish. And we're going to be dropping certain chemicals onto these and we're going to be looking for an effect. Now, just because we get an effect there does not mean that it's going to be an effective drug in the future. And this is one of the things that a lot of newspaper journalists don't tend to realise or tend to ignore because it, they can get a story out of it otherwise. But when you're reading things in the newspaper, we need to be very aware that they will take data from um, studies like this and they'll spin it into something that a lot of people get quite excited about. They were talking, I think there was one article that uh, Ben Goldacre was talking about. And it was in, it was one of the UK, I think it was Daily Mail or one of the similar newspapers in the UK. That they basically wrote a story that said red wine could prove effective at treating uh, breast cancer. In actual fact, it's, the, it's completely the opposite. It can increase the effects. But... What they did is they actually went back to a scientific study. Now, this scientific study, what it did is it looked at one particular chemical found in the skin of red grapes. And what they did is they found when that chemical was put onto cell cancer cells, it had an effect. Now, what it didn't say was what the effect was, whether it was positive or negative. It didn't say whether that chemical ended up in red wine just the fact it was in the skin of the grapes. It didn't say how much of it was needed. Uh, and it didn't say there's any other effects. So in, as a long-term basis, that study, yes, it was useful to scientists, but there was nothing in there in any way, shape or form that linked red wine to breast cancer. It was just some journalist somewhere decided, oh, this would make a story. And we need to be very aware of this when we read newspaper articles. OK, so yes, this is very effective as a preclinical trial to find out whether we think there is going to be an effect at some point. After that, we go on to animal testing. Now, I have done debates of this in school and I'm more than happy to do other debates on this one. Uh, Olivia is meant to be trying to get enough more students online so we can actually have an effective debate. I don't know how well she's going with that one at the moment. Um, but when we're looking at animal testing... This is very, very controversial. Um, I think it's a controversial, controversial. Anyway, I think it's that. Could be contrary. So the problem with animal testing is we are technically saying that humans are better than animals. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not giving my opinion one way or the other on this one. Um, I'm just talking about what the people will come up with. Now, a lot of people say, well, all life is the same. A lot of people say, well, it's not. The problem we've got is when we start testing on animals, if we said we weren't going to test on animals at all, and I'm only talking about medicine, I think if we look at cosmetics, 
The argument is absolutely black and white. Um, there is absolutely zero reason anywhere for testing cosmetics on animals. When we start looking at medicine, though, it is a very much a grey area. Because if we didn't do this initial test on animals, we'd have to use people. And there is a high chance those people could be put in lots of pain or they could die. So we get this sort of question of who would volunteer to do that. Because when we look at human rights, we can't force anyone to do it. So it is the area we need to have a look at. We have also got the area that actually, because the human and the animal and different animal anatomy and physiology and chemistry is slightly different, reactions or non-reactions in animals may not always have the same effect as it would in humans. However, it does give a very good indicator. So at the moment, whether we like it or not, um, it's done under very controlled conditions and it's done in a fairly restricted way, but we don't have any better examples at the moment. And again, like I said, I'm more than happy to do a Google Meet debate on this one and we can bounce some ideas around. I think it's really interesting to get everybody thinking. Whatever you believe with this, it's very important that you argue, um, that you can argue both sides of the argument. If you're massively pro, argue it, make sure you can argue against and vice versa. Because in an exam, if they put an evaluate question down, you'll have to come up with two or three arguments for, two or three arguments again, and then justify your opinion for it. And if you miss any of those steps, you lose out on getting potentially the six marks for that question. So make sure that whatever your opinion is, you can do both sides of the argument. Okay. And again, if you've got questions on any of that, we can come through it. We can go to it and have a look at it afterwards. So that's our preclinical trials. And notice the preclinical trials generally, and I'll just do this in a different colour, this does not involve humans. Okay, so the next step there is when we start going on to clinical trials. And as usual, I'll drop all these notes into Google Classroom afterwards so you can download them, have a look at them. Um, and if you need any supplementary work, just let me know. But yeah, next time we go on to clinical trials. And this will involve humans. So this is looking at human trials. And this is all done from a volunteering point of view. So people will volunteer to do this. So the very first clinical trial we look at is going to be a very low dose and a small group. And what we're looking here is we are purely looking for toxicity. We're looking for any heart potentially harmful effects. So we're giving tiny, tiny doses to start with to make sure that actually, when we give a higher dose, we're not gonna do that person some major harm. This doesn't always work. Sometimes we do get things wrong, and there have been people that have been very, very ill or even died in the past from this. Um, generally, it's very rare though, because of the conditions that they are put under are very, very controlled. And actually, anything that would be that toxic usually would have, a, have an effect in the cells and tissues or the animal testing beforehand. Um, but this is just to make sure that there isn't something quirky in humans that we've missed that may suddenly come around and actually have a bigger effect. So very, very low dose, small group trial. If it's deemed safe, we increase the size of the sample group. And what we start doing now is we start trying to determine the effective dose. So what we're looking at is this idea of efficacy which is actually the amount required to be effective, and we start looking at the dosage required. Before we start going on to any proper clinical trials, we start trying to actually test it for the treatment. Um, we will be giving this to people with certain conditions, but we're trying to find out what is the minimum dosage required to be effective. We're also gonna carry on looking for potential side effects, because actually what we don't want to do is go up to a maximum dose and suddenly realize that um, at a higher dose, there's going to be a major side effect for this particular drug. So we're looking for that as well. After this, we go on to our full clinical trial. And what we're looking at here is we are looking at double blind trials. And we're looking at placebos. Now, I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend looking at videos um, 
by a guy called Ben Goldacre. I'm more than happy to post uh, different video links into Google Classroom by him. Uh, ben Goldacre is a GP, uh, but he also writes for The Guardian. And one of the things he does now is he looks very closely at data and he looks at things that the news and the pharmaceutical companies report and the actual evidence for it. Because a lot of the time, the statistics that are reported by journalists and by pharmaceutical companies don't give an accurate picture. Now, because he writes for newspapers and that, and because he's a doctor, he's very good at talking and he can put things in a very, very good way. So I thoroughly recommend looking at some of his, um, like I said, some of the YouTube videos. Uh, he's also got an excellent book that should be compulsory reading called, uh, oh, hang on, Bad Science. Um, and the one that he's written after that is called Bad Pharma, which is looking at some of the evidence the pharmaceutical companies do. But I think this book, which was one, probably the first book I've read of his, uh, should be compulsory reading for lots of people. It really gives you a good idea how to look at data and how to try and balance what the newspapers are saying and what the actual realism is for that one. And I think as you grow up and as you sort of go through life, you're going to be presented with lots and lots of evidence. Whether it's a newspaper article, whether it's a television advert, whether it's somebody coming to your door trying to sell you new heatings, um, whether an electricity plan, double glazing, solar panels, um, new kitchen. Uh, you're going to be given lots and lots of data. And one of the skills, whether you choose not to do science or not in the future, it's so important that you can make these decisions so that people aren't trying to fob you off. They're not trying to not, and some of them won't deliberately lie, but then trying not, but that you don't make a poor decision waste lots of money or time etc because you didn't understand the evidence that's given to you so the more time you can look at this the easier it will be in the future so like i said whether or not you do science getting your head around this is really key so when we look at double blind trials then this is a trial where neither the doctor or patient Hang on, let's put this down here because I think it's really important we get the notes down. Doctors or patients do not know oh. who is receiving which medication. Okay. God, my writing's awful today. So, this is trying to find out basically, is our new drug more effective than the next best drug on the market. Well, that's what it should be doing. In some cases, we only end up testing it against a placebo. So let's just talk about placebos for a minute, because I think it's really, it's, I find it a fascinating study um, into sort of when we start looking at how the human mind works. So a placebo contains no drugs. What we're looking at is either some form of sugar pill or we might be looking at a saline, so a salt water injection. So in other words, there's no active med uh, chemicals in there in any way, shape or form. Or it could be a whole host of other things. In some cases, there have been fake operations done to people where they may have had a knee operation where they've cut the knee open, they've stitched it back up, but they've not actually done the operation itself. And what we're trying to have a look at is actually this is what the power of the mind in terms of dealing with pain, in terms of dealing with conditions. If we start looking at homeopathy, for instance, homeopathic remedies are all placebo. Now, that's not to say the person doesn't feel better, but it's because the power of the mind is telling them that they're taking something which is going to make you feel better. And I've done this on studies with classes. I have, um, and some of you maybe even done it with you. Generally, I have got uh, two large bottles of decaffeinated Coke. I've taken the labels off, I've poured them into cups, um, and I've labelled half them up as regular Coke and half them up as um, decaf. What I've then done is explained to students what the effects of caffeine is going to be, and I've really bigged up how it's going to make you feel uh, more hyper, uh, you're going to feel more on edge, you're going to feel more alert, everything's going to be quicker, and we go through and we really sort of big up the way it's going to make them feel. We do a reaction time test on everybody, 
and then we give half the class the caffeinated and half the class the sorry half the class the one they think is caffeinated and the other half of the class the ones they think is decaf in actual fact everybody in the class has decaffeinated coke at that point we leave it for five minutes so the caffeine can take effect and we carry on bigging up the effects and then we do a reaction time test and pretty much every single person who thinks they've had caffeine gets a faster reaction time so because they they think they've had it they actually end up reacting faster and they've done this on big studies before they've actually looked at gastric ulcers we have an ulcer inside your stomach where you can put a camera down and you can look at the ulcer um, they've then given people sugar pills um, the bizarre thing, they've actually found out that two sugar pills actually makes the ulcer get quicker faster than one sugar pill. So they're actually comparing two placebos, even though none of them have actually active ingredients in. They've done it with headaches and with pains where they've given uh, an injection. And they've actually found out that a salt water injection makes the pain go away quicker than a sugar pill, even though none of them have any medication in them. But it's because the person thinks they've had medication. And I think because an injection feels like a much more dramatic uh, painkiller than a sugar pill, those people actually end up relieving pain. Now, that's not to say we should be treating everything with placebo, because actually a lot of diseases, a lot of cases, we actually need, need active ingredients. But what it does go to show is that the power of the mind can have an effect on some pills. Unfortunately, a lot of pharmaceutical companies, when they are testing new drugs, they only test against placebos. Whereas what we really want to do is in a lot of cases, there are already drugs on the market. So if I'm developing a new drug, what I want to know is that my new drug is either more effective or has less side effects than the next best drug. I don't want to know that it's more effective than nothing because the drug on the market is already better than nothing, otherwise it wouldn't be on the market. So when we're talking about placebos or double blind trials, what we end up doing is we will give different groups of patients different medications, but the scientists that look at the top down level, they're the only ones that will know who's receiving which. And they will just give a random badged up box to the doctors to give to the patients but they will note down who receives which type of medication. And then afterwards, they'll collect the studies. Now, it's called double blind trials because actually we need to make sure that the doctor doesn't know or the patient. And that's because different people respond differently. So for instance, if the doctor knows they were giving somebody an actual medication, even though they weren't, it would be subconscious, they may behave slightly differently. And if they behave slightly differently, the patient may respond in a different way. So what we do is to make sure that nobody at all knows, only the scientists that give out the medication. And these patients would sign up to these studies. So they know that they're either going to be receiving one drug or a new drug, but they don't know which one. And then this will be done on thousands upon thousands of people. So let me just change my colour back here again. So this will be a very large study. And we will be looking at um, different backgrounds. What am I doing? We will be going with different ages. We'll be going with different genders. We'll be having um, different fitness levels. We will literally be comparing as many different type of people as we can to find out if there is any difference in the effect or even the dosage that might be required. We're going to be looking then at the side effects that go with it. So this is the big study and this is the one that takes a long, long time. So when we're looking currently at the uh, COVID-19 vaccination, for instance, we're going to need to be doing a study either against known medication. Uh, we don't have to compare it, but we need to make sure it's done on enough people to prove one, that it's effective and also there isn't any side effects. And this is where this huge study comes in, because it's going to be need to be tested on lots and lots of people to find out whether it actually works or not. So if you have any questions on any of that, do put it into the comments box um, or else I'm more than happy to come back through and have a look at some of this later on. But do make sure that you're happy with these terms. So make sure you understand what we mean by a double blind trial. Make sure you're happy with what we mean by placebo. 
uh, and make sure that you understand why we're doing it. Uh, just on a side, what is I find really bizarre, and again, I just find this fascinating with the way the mind works, is that you can give somebody a sugar pill, uh, but you can convince them that it has side effects as well. So you can then actually say to them that actually it might have the side effects of doing X, Y, and Z, and they actually start feeling it that way, which is why in a lot of cases I tell people not to read the... Um, if they're on a new medication, some people, the first thing they do is they go and read all of the information that comes with it. And of course, it lists every single potential side effects. So for the next few weeks, the person starts having some of these side effects, but it's not sure whether it's the brain telling them they've got them or that they do actually have them or not. <coughs> so yeah, because we can just convince ourselves we have these side effects. Likewise, we convince ourselves we're feeling better. Okay, so let's move on. Who have we got online today anyway? Everyone's really quiet. Just letting me uh, waffle on whilst going through. But yeah, say hello if you are online. Right, so we're going to have a look then at the... No, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to just talk about drug resistance for a minute. And then we'll see what the time is. I may leave monoclonal antibodies until next time. We'll see. So, when we're looking at drug resistancy or drug, this is where some drugs have stopped proving effective against certain types of pathogens. So, the classic one here is MRSA. We've also said that gonorrhea has uh, a resistant strain, and I think it's quite important for us to, that we sort of go through and we look at actually how is it that it's become resistant in the first place. Because it, that gives us quite a big indicator of how we can try and stop more bacteria becoming resistant in the future. So MRSA stands for, and I'm just going to make sure I get the spelling right for this one because I always get it wrong. Methylacillin resistant, and you don't need to know, you only need to know MRSA, but I'm going to put it down because it's useful to try and explain what's going on. Methylacillin resistant really long on this one staphylococcus aureus now that sounds really complicated it's not as bad as what it means so methylacillin is a type of penicillin so that is the antibiotics that we've been talking about and for a lot of people, unless you're allergic to this particular antibiotic, that would be the antibiotic of choice for quite a few different infections. Now, Staphylococcus aureus, or Staph aureus for short, we find on our skin um, or in our bodies every single day. So one of the reasons we wash our hands is because you will have this on you uh, and you'll be probably covered in normal Staph aureus. It's just one of those things we can't really do much about. Uh, like I said, you have more uh, more microorganisms on and in your body than you do actual body cells making your body up. So it's a very, very common one. Uh, we live with it. It can cause spots. Um, in some cases, it can cause an infection. But usually we just treat it with methylacillin or a different type of antibiotic. The problem is, because bacteria multiply every 20 minutes, so they multiply every 20 there is, a, there is a chance every time it divides of a mutation happening. So if we get a mutation that makes it resistant, we end up with a bacteria that is not killed by the antibiotics. And it only needs one bacteria. Okay, If you remember when we looked at this the other day, one bacteria after 24 hours you can have a number with about 19 zeros after it to give you an, the number of bacteria that's now in your body. So we get one bacteria um, that mutates. It's not killed off by the methylacillin. So the others, so the, hang on. So the rest of the SA is killed. Now, if you remember, those of you that have done ecology, sorry, evolution with me, you'll realise this is 
very, very similar bullet steps to when we're talking about evolution. We've got some form of variation. We've now got some form of competition. In other words, one of them is resistant, the others are not. All of the others are killed. The MRSA now multiplies with no resistance. Sorry. Actually, I'll get rid of that. There we go. The MRSA multiplies. So in other words, it's not being killed off by the penicillin. So we then need to use a different... Let's put it down here. Use a different antibiotic. Now, for a lot of you, you will probably turn around and go, that's fine, just give a different antibiotic. And actually, years ago, so when I was... Um, well pretty much until early 20s, I think, if you went to the doctors with almost anything, there's a high chance you'll come away with some antibiotics, just in case you got an infection. The problem is, the more antibiotics you give, rather than letting your body fight it off, the higher the likelihood of the pathogens mutating to become resistant to that particular type of drug. So, what happened is, we've ended up with this superbug, but if we keep using different antibiotics, what doctors are worried about is if it mutates again and becomes resistant to another type of antibiotic as well. Because what happens then is we start reducing the number of antibiotics we can use. And we actually don't have that many that are effective. And what we could end up with in the future is a superbug, which cannot be killed off with any of the known drugs that we have. Which means we then get to the scenario where either our bodies fight it ourselves or we end up dying because we can't fight it off. Um, and that's quite a scary world to be in. Um, likewise with the gonorrhea. The gonorrhea, in exactly the same way, has multiplied. A mutation means it, can, it is no longer killed off by penicillin, which means different antibiotics have to be used. So if it mutated again, we could end up with a strain of gonorrhea, which again, we could not treat. So this is a very real worry for doctors. So one of the things that comes up in exams quite a bit is you need to be able to talk about what are we doing to try and reduce this happening again. So simple list. So I'm just going to call this So reducing the likelihood of further resistance. To start with, the most important thing, and to be fair, everybody should do this anyway, if you get given antibiotics, always take the full course. Now, the main reason for this is if you only take half the course because you're feeling better, there will be some bacteria left in your body, and that bacteria can then reproduce, carry on reproducing which means there's a high chance or higher chance that one of them can mutate to become a superbug. Because then what you have to do is you have to go back to the doctors, you get more antibiotics, you're on it for a longer period of time. Those bacteria are multiplying with the antibiotics in your system, so there is a bigger chance of them becoming resistant. So we always take the full course. The doctors don't prescribe... Oh, don't prescribe unless necessary. And in some cases, they won't even prescribe it until you've had a test to find out what type of uh, infection you've actually got. So they'll only prescribe um, if it's absolutely vital. Now, we will also try and develop new drugs. The problem with this one, and lots of students go to this straight away as, well, we'll just make new drugs. This is very slow. Very, very slow. Uh, you've only got to look at some of the current infection things around us at the moment to realise, actually, we can't just suddenly go, ah, yeah, let's just go and treat that. Some drug developments can take up to 25 years to produce a new drug. Some of them are quicker. It depends on whether we know the drug, uh, whether we've done pre-testing, but we can't just suddenly come up with this brand new drug which works in a different way because we're still looking at ways those drugs can work and we need to make sure it's not going to be active and kill off the body cells as well as the bacteria. 
So it's not just enough in an exam to say, well, we need to develop new drugs. We need to look at the ways that we stop the bacteria developing in the future. Um, we can also put down hygiene in here. So for instance, if you're going into hospitals, washing your hands regularly, using alcohol gel regularly. Uh, a lot of people now, before they go in for uh, some form of uh, operation, what their hospitals will do is they'll swab them and they'll test them for Staph aureus and MRSA. And then, because we often have MRSA on our bodies and we just live with it day in, day out, because it's just a normal bacteria, it's only if it actually infects us that it causes a problem. But for most of us, our immune systems are fine. Um, and unless it gets into our system, or we're not washing our hands, or we have a cut, or whatever, low immune system, it's not a problem. But if we do go into hospital for an operation, because we're going to be cut open at that point, in some cases, if they test you and you have got it, they will actually prescribe you with, uh, it's like a shower gel, but it's an antibiotic, antiseptic shower gel to kill off all of the antibiotic, the bacteria on your body. Um, before you go in. So good hygiene is also one way we can think about with this one. So in the exam, make sure that you are happy with those things. Always take the full course and only prescribe when absolutely necessary. And whilst we're doing that, we will carry on trying to develop new drugs. Right, let me just check my list to make sure I've covered everything on that uh, before we move on. Cool, yeah, we've done pretty much all of that. Right, what I'm going to talk about next time, uh, I'm going to leave it here for today. I'm going to jump onto Google Chat in a minute uh, because the next one's a good topic to actually finish on. Uh, let me just make a quick note on here. Okay. Next week, I'm going to talk about monoclonal antibodies because it's a bit more of a tricky topic and I want to make sure we've got enough time to go through. We also need to talk about plant diseases um, and plant defences. How do plants defend themselves? Because we've spent quite a lot of time talking about humans, uh, but we do need to go through and have a look at plants. Uh, and then the other thing we're going to have a look at is how do we work safely with microorganisms? How do we grow microorganisms? How do we grow it safely in a lab? in a school, in industry. It's something I used to do for a living before I was a teacher, uh, when I used to work in the food industry. So we can go through actually how can we be safe when we're working with it and we'll look through the procedures for that and any of the wrong quiet practicals around this topic. So thanks for joining me. I'm gonna post, give me one or two minutes and I'll post the link in Google Meet. So if you want to jump on board and ask any questions, feel free and I'll see you in a minute. Even if it's just pop on and say hello. Take care.